last presenter of the day is Reese Feist. He's going to be talking to us about a uh, fluorescein consult. All right. So this is actually going to count as one of my neuro grain rounds. I talked to Dr. Warner, so just make sure you mark that off when you get back upstairs. <laughs> so this was a consult request. So actually, Renee was covering consults, but he was busy studying North Carolina macular dystrophy. So he asked me to see the patient instead. So he got called by the neurology service about a 50-year-old guy who was admitted for aseptic meningitis. And so their specific request was we need a FA to evaluate for vasculitis. So this gentleman was transferred from an outside hospital a few days before for these recurrent episodes of aseptic meningitis. This was his, was his third episode in about a year. Um, he initially presented to the outside hospital this most recent time after developing a fever, feeling shaky and weak. Uh, at the outside hospital, he was found to have an INR of 4.1 and a subdural hemorrhage. Um, so he was given vitamin K and FFP and then transferred here. So his past medical history, it turns out he's got a history of factor V light, and we're not sure if he was like homozygous, heterozygous for it. We don't have any of his other records, um, but he was anticoagulated for it. He had a history of a myocardial infarction at a young age. He's got hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He also had uh, mesenteric artery thrombosis and has had a stent in his uh, superior mesenteric artery, it looks like. He's got depression and then BPH. So he had a cardiac bypass, quadruple bypass at a young age, the SMA stent, and then also had an incisional hernia repair. Um, otherwise, he denied any past ocular history. So he's a current smoker, kind of varies, uh, maybe two to three packs per day for the past 20 years or so. He drinks about two beers a month and then Unfortunately, used spice for about four months, about four years ago, but got clean after that. He still lives with his parents. He's a former welder and metal artist. No international travel. He, like Brian Stagg, he's never left Utah his entire life. And, um, <laughs> he used to have a dog as a child, but no cats. <laughs> um, he denies any IV drug use or any sexually transmitted diseases. He, the only drug use he admitted to is the spice a, a few years ago. Um, a family history of a uh, heart attack in his father, but he seemed to be a little bit older age. And then uh, maternal grandparents both had heart attacks in their 60s. So. When I saw him, he was kind of confused, but um, was able to talk to him. He was appropriate, but just kind of forgetful about things. But really, the only things he reported having were some headache and then some itchy skin. Otherwise, he denied everything else that I asked him in terms of uveitis stuff. Um, his initial exam, so he was uh, fevering at 102.9, um, but then was otherwise hemodynamically stable. He was thin, kind of disheveled. Uh, kind of sweaty. Um, his physical exam, the general physical exam, wasn't otherwise too remarkable. Um, he was alert and oriented to person place in the year, um, but kind of missing out on kind of minor details about you know his past medical history. Um, the neurology service when they evaluated him felt that he had a little bit of uh, clonus in his left ankle, um, but otherwise they weren't picking up too too much. So. Like everybody that comes through the ED, he got a CT head. Um, it showed these kind of diffuse foci of intraparenchymal calcifications that they were thinking could be a sequela of uh, prior granulomatous process. So when he first came in, their, their first thought was for something like neurocysticercosis. Um, then they also noted a lot of uh, volume loss, more than they would have expected, and then the small uh, frontal subdural hematoma. Maybe. So these were mostly posterior, and then I'll show you the MRI later on. So he got a lumbar puncture and had a ton of white cells in his CSF, uh, mostly neutrophils. His glucose was a touch low, <coughs> but not horribly so. His IgG was elevated, albumin was elevated, total protein was elevated. Um, there is no growth on the bacterial cultures, and then the P HSV PCR was negative. So when we saw him, his, he needs some glasses, but his best corrected visual acuity was like 20-20 minus 2 in both eyes, 
pressure is normal, no APD, and full confrontational fields and extraocular movements. And then you can see down here, I noted that he was also confused. So um, He w had a lot of really bad dry eye and then some mild cataracts, but otherwise when I looked in, we didn't really see anything else. He didn't have any cell in the anterior chamber, no vitreous cell. His optic nerves looked normal, and then his vessels looked pretty unremarkable. We didn't see any sheathing. There's no snowballs or snow banking out in the periphery either. So we did what they asked and ended up getting a fluorescein. So the early phases were really unremarkable, but then on these kind of peripheral, peripheral sweeps, you can see these changes out in the periphery. Um, so I actually, you know, it wasn't too, too dramatic, but I looked at these with Dr. Vitale right after we got him just to kind of run everything by him, and he, he agreed that these were abnormal. So kind of the, <coughs> the initial differential was, you know, just kind of thinking in broad categories, so some kind of vascular event, so hypertensive retinopathy, Eels disease, Susak's disease, didn't really look all that much like Susak's or anything. Um, when you're looking at uveitis patients, you always have the infectious stuff on the list. Uh, other neoplastic processes, so lymphoma, leukemia, uh, autoimmune conditions like Bechet, sarcoid, VKH, intermediate uveitis, or lupus. Um, you know, doesn't really look like anything congenital. Uh, you know, I don't know, I didn't really expect to see anything like that after a traumatic episode, but he did have a fall down the stairs a few weeks ago, and that's what gave him the subdural. Um, you know, things like diabetic retinopathy, you could get some really far peripheral changes or just idiopathic. So his labs came back, so his CBC and BMP were both unremarkable. Uh, they drew a cystocercosis IgG, which came back negative. Annie Smith antibody, Joe 1 antibodies, SSA, SSB were negative. His ANCA panel was negative, and his aquaporin 4 was negative. So he did have some positive labs. So his anti-double-stranded DNA came back positive. It was 1 to 80, so not super high, but still elevated, above 1 to 40. His ANA was really high at 1 to 2,000. Um, his sed rate was elevated. They did a serum protein electrophoresis, so his total protein was a little bit elevated. His alpha-1 globulins were up. Um, and then they did an antiphospholipid antibody panel that was positive for the cardiolipin antibodies, positive for the beta-2 glycopro glycoprotein antibodies, and then he had a positive lupus anticoagulant with the uh, Dilute-Russell Venom Viper test. So after they cleared his stents, they were finally able to get an MRI. So they noted these areas of uh, what, what seemed to be um, kind of subacute ischemia that they felt like corresponded more to those what they were calling calcifications on the uh, CT scan. Uh, and then based on the distribution and the appearance of them, they felt that it, it could be a sequela of vasculitis. So they included lupus and antiphospholipid antibody syndrome uh, on their differential with this. Um, they noted a little bit of vessel wall enhancement uh, along some of the cortical veins, um, but felt like that could potentially be due to the uh, subdural hemorrhage. So just to talk, you know, they, they haven't finished working up all the uh, infectious processes, processes. We asked them to do a lot, and they didn't do any of it. Um, but the stuff that he has come, had come back, they, they felt like it's consistent with a diagnosis of lupus with antiphospholipid syndrome. So lupus, obviously, is a life-threatening multisystem autoimmune disease. Renal involvement is kind of the most common serious complication. You can get widespread arthritis that typically affects the hands and knees. Mucocutaneous involvement typically involves the, the classic malar rash, but then all the other kinds of rashes and all the other kind of or mucous membrane involvement as well. You can have pleuropulmonary involvement, pericarditis, and then a accelerated atherosclerosis is also a feature. And then there's kind of diffuse neurologic involvement. Um, you can have aseptic meningitis, cerebrovascular disease, demyelinating syndromes, seizure, and then even things like mood disorders and psychosis are attributed to lupus. The clinical criteria is, it, there's a ton. Um, so this patient, he, he met the clinical criteria with neurologic disease. Um, you know, 
he, when I asked him, he did not have a rash, or when I saw him, he did not have a rash, and he denied history of rash, but um, on, I guess when rheumatology talked to him <coughs> and talked to his mother, uh, they did feel like he has had a malar rash in the past, so they felt like that further supported the diagnosis as well. Um, to make the diagnosis, you need at least one of these clinical criteria and at least one of these immunologic criteria for a total of four. Um, and so he had a positive ANA, a positive double-stranded DNA, and then a positive antiphospholipid antibody panel. So he, he met, meets the criteria for diagnosis of lupus. So what does it do to the eye? It's, it's pretty diverse. The most common would be just keratoconjunctivitis. Uh, so <coughs> one of the papers I found said that it, it's affecting about 30% of, of lupus patients, and they, they identified it as the most common uh, manifestation of the disease, but other corneal involvement can involve in, include peripheral ulcerative keratitis. So in terms of the retina, you get retinal hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, arterial or narrowing, vascular tortuosity. There's a lot of different things it can do, and one of the one of the things that can make it difficult is just kind of distinguishing just classic lupus retinopathy from a hypertensive crisis in lupus patients as well. Um, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome increases the risk of ocular and CNS vaso occlusion by about four four times. In terms of other parts of the eye, so sclera and uvea, uh, rarely causes scleritis or episcleritis, but it's been reported. Um, a, a wide variety of uh, neuroophthalmic dis disorders, so you can get an ischemic optic neuropathy, kind of less of an inflammatory, um, like a true inflammatory, but you can still have damage to the axons that way. Cranial nerve 6 palsy, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, optic neuritis. In the orbit, they've identified myositis, vasculitis, and trochleitis. And then these patients are either are immunosuppressed for a variety of reasons, either you know, on our doing or kind of their own. So you, you always have to consider other kind of infectious processes. So it's things like retinal necrosis with a herpes virus, CMV, and dopthomitis. Any phospholipid antibody syndromes, uh, prothrombotic disorder that can affect both the venous and then arterial circulation. So, in in terms of the venous, the venous hits that people get usually it's a deep vein thrombosis in the legs, and then the most common arterial site is in the uh, cerebrovascular circulation. Um, catastrophic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is characterized by clots in multiple small vascular beds, which leads to multi-organ failure. Um, it's diagnosed based on uh, lab positive labor test laboratory testing that's kind of extensive, so with antibodies that persist over a period of months. Um, testing for beta-2 glycoprotein 1, anticardiolipin antibodies, or a, a positive lupus anticoagulant assay. Um, it's found in about 30% of, of patients with SLE. Um, and most of the authors I found where they wrote about eye manifestations with this didn't feel like just regular systematic screening was beneficial for most people in the absence of other stigmata of the disease. Um, so the retinopathy and lupus, like I talked about, the most common findings would be cotton wool spot, hemorrhages, and then optic disc edema. The retinal vascular changes are thought to stem from fibrinoid degeneration with necrosis of the vessel wall, often in the absence of inflammation, both kind of on a pathologic basis and on a clinical basis. So which kind of fits with what this gentleman had. So, you know, no cell, no, no vitreous findings at all. So you can, it, when you have these kind of changes on the FA in the absence of the inflammation, that, that's one thing that you need to consider. Um, you can develop a severe occlusive retinopathy, but this is, this is definitely more rare. Um, but this is really where, what causes a lot of the vision loss in the patients that have kind of the sequelae from this. Um, most of the authors suggested immunomodulatory therapy, and then as the retina, the retinopathy that we're identifying is usually associated with uh, renal changes. And one of the studies found about, you know, maybe 50% of the patients with just diagnosed lupus without uh, diagnosed ocular involvement had renal dysfunction, but it was about 100% in patients where they had eye findings as well. So. Um, really serious condition, you know, it's not always, treatment's not always aimed at the eye, but just protecting the rest of the body. Um, anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy are used with variable success in treating the occlusive disease. Um, so just to talk a little bit, this, this guy came in as, you know, 
been like over, just over a week, so not, not too long. But they started him on IV solumedrol and gave him a, a pulse of that, and then we're going to start him on cyclophosphamide. He's already been anticoagulated with warfarin, uh, given his history of factor V Leiden. And so they're planning to continue that. And I'm not sure if they've discussed doing any antiplatelet therapy, but that would be one thing to consider. You know, fortunately, this time, looking at his FA with Dr. Vitali when he first came in, it was you know, relatively mild and not felt to have anything vision threatening. So that was good from an eye standpoint. But I think this was one of the kind of the rare cases where we've been able to help with the fluorescein. I know Eileen talked about this at uh, Resident Alumni Day the other day. And it's, the yield's pretty low, but this is one of those things where it can be helpful and one, one we don't see a lot of, so. Dr. Shakur? I'd be curious to see what happens um, to that peripheral glass pitcher once he is on the <coughs> phosphamide. Yeah. The, well, fact, the fact is we don't have a normative database of patients that, uh, of a wide field angiography. Mm -hmm. And the um, fact remains that there have been studies that have shown that normal patients, and in quotes, normal patients have a uh, abnormal vasculature in the periphery, and this can represent all kinds of uh, issues. Uh, we just really don't know what the circulation looks like in the periphery because we haven't done enough white field angiograms. So uh, is this truly a lupus vasculopathy in the eye? Uh, I mean, it, 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 it's hard to really know mm -hmm. when we don't really know what normal is. Just do keep that in mind. So he's coming to see you in a couple of weeks, so. That'll be excellent. Um, yeah, and you know, I, that's when, when I first saw this, I, I, I didn't know quite what to make of it, but you know, the guy wasn't diabetic. He, his blood pressure's been normal, so you know, we didn't have another explanation for it. And you know, it was more than kind of what we've expected to see, because we, we do a lot of these fluorescein consults, actually, on some of these consult patients, and most of them are you know, stone-cooled normal. They've got just like one little vessel that's lighting up just way, way out in the far periphery. But this was a little bit more than we expected. And that's what we, we ended up talking to Dr. Vitali about. And it, was, it wasn't, you know, vision, vision concerning, but it was more, definitely more than we thought we were going to see, so. I think it would be an interesting uh, study. Yeah. If any of the residents are interested, you know, uh, to just do white field on geography on, say, everybody in this room and see how many uh, yeah. So I saw something like actually in one of the most recent issues of ophthalmology uh, where they did do wide field and a bunch of normals, and I think they predominantly found non perfusion. Yeah. I'm not sure about which that that's been reported. Like, non perfusion has been reported. I mean, you know, yeah. Everybody with, uh, you, know, you have heterozygous with fever, you have uh, all kinds of. Yeah, and I think that that study in ophthalmology too was trying to come up with like a you know, one of those like OCD kind of lines to say, this is where you expect ninety five percent of people to have normal flow and then beyond this point it's not not unremarkable to have that. So I didn't see where, the, yeah, they, like you said, I didn't see where they had any evidence, any changes in terms of the leakage too. I think it was all the, the non-perfusion stuff. So, super interesting case. Thanks.